artist and teacher Marco Buzzi, Disney, Lego, LucasArts, Hasbro, among many others, always wanted to be an artist. However, he was not the artsy kid or was any good at art making. Today, he's one of the biggest references and uses various mediums, including digital art, while keeping his style consistent. Join us today as we talk about the true meaning behind having a style and how to find yours, digital versus traditional art, what comes first, Marco's biggest influences, tips on getting the most out of watercolor while it's drying, and how to get started with art. Want to be part of the show? Then send in your questions or topics you'd like to see covered to our email at hello at etcherlab.com. If you send us an audio recording, we might include it in the episode. Hi, I'm Anya, and this is Make More Art, a podcast by Etcher, meant to inspire you to keep on creating. Now let's hear from our guest. When did you first fall in love with art? Oh, well, when I was very, very young, like um, second or third grade, I remember wow. really being fascinated with the kids who could draw naturally. Mm -hmm. And I, I was not one of them. And I was jealous and envious and all that stuff. And so that was when I first realized that there was something about art that I was in love with, mm -hmm. but I couldn't do it. So, so then if you fast forward then to I turned 19 years old, mm -hmm. I decided that Oh, I learned that maybe you can actually learn how to do art because I had seen um, Pixar animators. They had a blog uh, and uh, they were like, oh, you, you practice this thing called life drawing and life drawing can you know, teach you. That's how artists learn how to draw. So I'm like, oh, well, I, I found a life drawing studio near my university that I was going to and I attended classes. And that's right. Probably right there is where I actually fell in love with learning art at age 19. So it's kind of a two stage answer there. So that's really cool. So you fell in love with art at, as a kid. You fell in love with making art as a yeah. late teenager. But when you were 19, did you know that was something you wanted to do for a living? Or was that something that you just felt so passionate about that you had to do something about it? Yeah, uh, both, actually. I did want to do art for a living. But uh, because I, uh, I couldn't draw, like I wasn't drawing until I was, until I was 19. Um, I, I wanted to do art via the computer. So I, I made the mistake of thinking that, Hey, I can't draw, but the computer can do art and I can do art on the computer. That's not really how it works, but I did actually learn a lot of computer software in my high school years. Mm -hmm. I spend my nights, like just uh, hungered down in the basement, learning uh, computer 3d programs and stuff. So I did a lot of that and that actually got me into uh, film school. Mm -hmm. And it was, and so I was studying film and I knew some 3D. So I wanted to do like visual effects or something like that. Right. But then when I discovered drawing, because uh, in Canada, you enter university when you're 19. Okay. So that same year that I entered university to do like 3D and film stuff, mm -hmm. I discovered drawing. So over the course of my university years, I kind of switched my interest from, uh, from 3D to drawing. And then by the time I graduated university, I was fully on, on the train of drawing and painting. And I, and I always wanted to do art for a living, yeah. Yeah, and, and what about now? Because we're, we're going to go back in time in just a second, but I was looking at your most recent art, and you do both traditional, digital, which is something I want to yeah. talk about in a little bit more detail, but you also do 3D stuff. Yes, but I'm definitely not a professional 3D artist. Mm -hmm. I, I only know enough 3D to um, do a few things that can help with the 2D. Mm -hmm. um, any, you know, uh, if you are a conceptual like concept artist and illustrator like I am, you will learn quickly that the industry uses 3D tools a lot, even mm -hmm. for 2D art. Just things like mapping out perspective becomes super quick on the computer. Like, yeah, you can draw it out and I have those skills, but it's like, why spend five hours dr drawing everything in meticulous perspective mm -hmm. if you could just map it out on the computer first and then bring your artistic skill to that because, t uh, you know, deadlines get tighter and tighter uh, all the time. So if you're a professional 2D, 2D artist, you're almost like forced into 3D a little bit. Mm -hmm. So the skills I have in 3D are just enough to keep me afloat, really. I am looking to expand them, though. I'm interested in expanding them. Yeah, I see that a lot. A lot of professional artists, 2D artists, diving a little bit on the 3D. And... Mm -hmm. 
putting myself on the shoes of wannabe professionals, of students who are trying to break into the industry, that might seem super overwhelming in the sense that, oh my God, oh my God, I need to learn all the fundamentals and the color theory and all of that, and then 3D, and then they go and spread themselves thin around everything, and it all becomes too much, and so many of us then quit. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, well, um, the way... I agree. Spreading yourself too thin is a good way to never really get good at any one thing. Um, so what I recommend is, is approaching it the opposite way, which which I did, but I did it by accident where I oh. didn't. I was, I, you know, like I said, I was uh, interested in 3D before, but when I discovered drawing, 3D just went away in, in my life. I, I completely okay. forgot about it. And I was obsessed with drawing and painting. So that's, that's all I focused on. So uh, as you suggested, I learned things like the color theory and the fundamentals of drawing. I learned all that. And then many years later, like I said, uh, I started at 19. So let's say I'm now, well, today I'm 38. But right when I was like 34, I'm, so four, you know, four or four years ago, five years ago, I'm like, you know what? Let's try that 3D thing again after like 15 years. Yeah. And so I was able, but I, what I found was because I had developed the skills of, you know, of a 2D artist and the foundations and stuff, mm-hmm. 3D was, it's, it's easy. Uh, if you have the foundations, if you try and learn everything at once, yeah. then I agree with you. It's it, You spread yourself too thin because like the fundamental, like, there's so many little things that go into everything. So I'd say pick the thing you're most interested in. Learn, like, you know, spend, I don't know how many years, I spent many years on it, but spend at least a year on that, 3D or drawing, whatever it is, painting. And then only after that, then start sprinkling in some of the other stuff. It can will be easier. It'll be easier. Can you walk us through briefly your whole path? I mean, because... Since we're mentioning it, I'd like to have a better understanding of what you focused on and when. Yeah, sorry, my timeline is very co- convoluted. <laughs> okay, so when I'm when I'm young, when I'm uh, in high school, mm-hmm. I can't draw, so I'm doing 3D. Yeah. Then I get to university for 3D and film stuff. Mm-hmm. I went to film school. Uh, I discovered drawing. Forget forgot about 3D, and I drew from just drew and drawn paint from age 19 to say age like. 32, 33, somewhere around there. Mm-hmm. Then, so that's like that's like 13 years, maybe. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I bring 3D back into my life, but still with drawing as the focus. Yeah. Like 3D is not my focus. Drawing and painting still is. And like I said, today I'm, I'm 38 and I kind of have both. Uh, I kind of do both. So, you know, uh, if I'm doing an illustration that has heavy perspective or something that I'm just pre-visualizing, I usually do a quick mock-up in 3D and, and then draw from there. And what about the never-ending fight between traditional and digital where did you start uh, and when did you shift and what are your thoughts about okay, that okay yeah that's, that's another layer of this whole thing okay so <laughs> i started traditionally um because uh, so when i was 19 years old the year was 2001 um digital was there people did digital art but it wasn't very popular and tablets were very expensive so i, I started you know traditionally I, I didn't really care about digital yet i hadn't really discovered it uh so i learned to you know uh, do life drawing with good old newsprint and charcoal and, you know, pencils and pens. Uh, and I did that for four or five years. And right around the, th- maybe three or four years, right around that, I, dis- I I realized, hey, you know, looks like the industry is going digital and so many artists are doing very painterly work, but with digital. Uh, beca- you know, so I was using traditional tools, like I said, pencil, charcoal, some oil paint as well. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, you know, three years into my art journey, I'm like, hey, l- let's try this computer thing because, remember I was really into 3d so I knew computers like I knew about computers how to use them how to build them all that stuff so I'm like hey let's let's get a tablet and I saved up some money with uh, my side job there for a tablet I bought the Intuos it was an Intuos 2 9 by 12 tablet and I remember going to the mall that day to buy that tablet Um, and I came home and I and I loaded up Photoshop and uh, started using a tablet and oh boy it was the worst experience ever because (laughs) like you know the your hand (laughs) yeah your hand is down at the tablet and your eyes are up at the yeah. computer. I'm like, I was like a little kid. I'm like, how do you do this? How does this is work? <laughs> how does hand computer thing? Yeah. And like Cintiqs just didn't exist then. Yeah. Uh, you know, digital display tablets just weren't a thing in, in around then. So it took, obviously you get used to it, right? It, it took mm-hmm. me a few weeks, but I got used to it and I was able to then plug in my existing skill set 
uh, to the extent I had one. It wasn't that big yet, but uh, into digital. And then I learned both digital and traditional together. I never mm -hmm. stopped doing traditional art. And I still, to this day, I yeah. do traditional art. Because with Etcher, with my mini workshop coming up and my live demo, we're going to be doing traditional stuff cool. and digital as well. But we're going to start traditionally. Oh, I was going to dive into. OK, we have to dive yeah. into there right now. But just one more thing. Uh, I think it's really important what you just said. So you got you started out traditionally. You got yeah. a lot of, you know, what you had to learn, all, all the, the stuff you knew. You applied it to digital because it's just a different way to do art. It's yeah. different. It's a different tool set, but it's still the same mindset, though, the same thinking, kind of, even though you're working sure. in layers and, you know, you're not waiting for the watercolor to dry and, mm. you know, and you, you can't control uh, op op opacity in Photoshop or whatever software you use. Sure, it's different. But at the same time, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a big conversation going out there meaning oh if you do digital art you cannot do traditional or a bunch of misconceptions misconceptions about one being better than the other when they all come from the same root it's just a different tool set yeah. right yeah oh absolutely yeah and i think one enriches the other you know uh, i get a question a lot like should it, should you start traditionally and then go digital yeah. or can you just start digital you could do anything it does you can learn any way you want I'm glad I started traditionally, though, because mm -hmm. just the way you interact with the tools, it um, I don't it's very hard to explain. But the limitations you have with traditional, like you said, the things like waiting for the watercolor to dry. Mm -hmm. Well, there are certain things you can do in that process that tells you how to use digital media, because mm -hmm. with digital. Yeah, the main drawback with digital, in my opinion, is that you can do anything mm -hmm. and you have it's, it's very it's limitless. So how do you act in a playground where there's no fence? So you can just go anywhere, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're going to get lost. Mm -hmm. So if you're a beginner in the digital realm, you're going to get lost. And I think traditional media is, is a great way to learn, you know, where the boundaries are, what you can do when, um, what looks good, what doesn't work. And then in the computer, not to, not to say you have to replicate that, but you can start there and you know your way around and then you can branch out and explore those limitless options. Yeah. So that's why I'm happy I did it the way I did it, even though I didn't know I was doing it like that. It just happened to be, you know, coinciding with my my timeline. If I were to start art today, I would probably be starting digitally. Yeah. Any particular reason why? Oh, just because digital is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. You know, if I were starting today it would be more obvious to me to get a tablet because like mm -hmm. everyone has it, right? Yeah. That Whereas makes back sense. in 2001, no one had a tablet. Then maybe well, uh, using your, your line of thinking, if someone wants to try uh, digital as the first option, maybe a good way to do it so they don't get overwhelmed or lost would be to set very rigid boundaries. I will mm -hmm. only use this tool or I will only draw in black or something like that. And maybe just by having a set amount of rules while painting digitally, it will help not to deviate a lot and to learn things slowly. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think that's a good point. Uh, I have seen some of my own students have mm -hmm. found success doing that uh, in their early studies. Uh, I, I remember one of my students was only limiting himself to like one brush and, mm -hmm. and but it worked, it worked for him. And then I, in the course of me helping him out, I encouraged him, okay, like try these other brushes because it'll help you get different edges and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, wax on, wax off. <laughs> and I'm going to kick you when you wax on, wax off like super fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I should have, I should have hit him with some of that. <laughs> well, if you're listening to this right now, um, okay, the, the message will be passed on. You mentioned your live demo and mini workshop. So yes, you will be uh, teaching with us at Etcher and you'll be doing a, a live demo and a mini workshop soon. So can you tell us a little bit about what you will be doing on, on that demonstration? Yeah, <clears throat> so um, I mentioned I still do traditional media a lot. And one of the main things I do is I take a sketchbook outside and I just paint from life. Little quick sketches, you know, I, I use those tiny little moleskin watercolor sketchbooks. But also, I've been, now I've been using the Etcher stuff because mm -hmm. you, you guys have been great, um, awesome enough to send me stuff, uh, for which I'm very grateful. And I've been nice. using, using Etcher little sketchbooks outside. Um, but before that, I was using those tiny moleskin ones and um, <clears throat> just doing watercolor sketches. So I have, have, I have sketchbooks full of them, and you'll see some of those during my mini workshop. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm the reason I do that is because it's the great way to capture light and color very quickly. And because the sketchbooks tend to be small, um, so they can fit in your pocket and stuff, the sketches are not necessarily detailed, but 
they happen very quickly. Mm-hmm. And drilling things quickly and doing a lot of repetition is, I think, the best way to learn about light and color um, and, and composition and all, the, all these things. So I've got tons of sketches. I've chosen one particular sketch that I think will translate well to a live demonstration. Mm -hmm. And um, I will show you just in sort of in the comfort of our own homes, I'll show you how you can approach these things, you know, using some photo reference, but with the mindset of being outside where, you know, time is limited and, you know, you're, you're maybe standing against a tree. It's uncomfortable outside to sketch. The sun changes. Yeah, so you learn how to like act on your instinct and you hone those instincts. So I'm going to try and do the presentation with a focus on that. Uh, and that'll be the mini, uh, sorry, the live demo. The live demo. Then the mini cool. work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then the mini workshop, which will follow a few weeks after that, will be um, a bit of a combination throwing digital in there wow. and sort of taking, picking up where that left off and sort of, at least for now, the plan is to take that sketch that we do in the live workshop and say, and recreate it digitally and showing, I guess like you were, we were talking about, uh, Anya getting the, uh, using limitations within the software to mm-hmm. match a traditional mindset. And we can explore t- together like digital tools that, you know, you can understand. Uh, I mean that you can like work with quickly and yeah. th- it becomes very understandable and we're not going to like do these crazy things. We're just going to paint as if it were traditional. Cool. And uh, so the free live demonstration will be on January 31st. If you're listening to this uh, interview before then, then you're still on time to be live for the free demonstration on our YouTube channel. Uh, All links will be on the post associated with this episode at etcherlab.com forward slash Marco. So you can find the whole information there. If you're listening to this after January 31st, uh, fret not because the mini workshop is two to three weeks after that. I'm not sure if we have a date picked yet, but it will be somewhere in f- mid February. Yeah, I don't have my calendar in front of me, but I think it's the 15th. Yeah, I think that's that does ring yeah. a bell. So yeah, so uh, and you can get the recording if you can't make it. So anyway, I hope you can join us for the live demo and the mini workshop because this is going to be fun. Yeah, Actually, please join us. I'm looking forward to talking to everyone while while we paint and create something together. And you you'll get to ask Marco questions live. So come. Uh, one more thing. Um, that this live demo will it be watercolor? Yes, I, I primarily work in watercolor, but I do add some gouache to it. Well, mm-hmm. I, I add white gouache, which will allow me to mix, uh, make watercolors a bit more opaque. So it's kind of a mix between just transparent watercolor and some op- opaque watercolor as well. Yeah. So, what I love about your work, I love many things about your work, but what I love is how you maintain the sense of light and color and like I, I can't put a word into it but it feels like it's just so fluffy and, and light and it makes me feel so happy <laughs> and that, but that quality oh, is the quality is that, that quality is both in your traditional and digital work which for me is mind-boggling really it's beautiful um no oh, thank you so much why what do you think is for you what's the hardest part about working with watercolor um, not second guessing yourself because mm. the quality uh, that you describe, which thank you for that compliment. I, I, I go for those. I've never, what'd you call it? Fuzzy? <laughs> yeah. You see, think? English is not my main language. So I come up with, like, yeah, I come up with words every day, all the time. I think my I coworkers might have a dictionary just for me by, by now, but. <laughs> no, I love it. Fuzzy is, I, I mean, I paint that green fuzzy monster all the time. I love fuzzy that is a great word. So much. Fuzzy is a great word. So thank you. Um, but the hardest part, like to get that look, it, you can't be second guessing yourself. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, sure. A couple of things you can change your mind on, but like, if you put down a brush stroke, you should leave it. Even if it's, uh, like let's say it's wrong it's probably better and this is a generalization but it's probably better to be wrong yet confident and move on Mm -hmm. than to like say oh this should go like that and this should go like that that usually doesn't give you the fuzzy look Uh you want to like put down a stroke you know i learned i'm inspired by uh sar john singer sergeant with so Mm -hmm. so many painters are this is nothing new but sergeant you know what you can see it in his painting he would go boom and say that's done Boom, that's done. So I try and do that. You try and put down a stroke and move to the next stroke and then and and not second guess yourself. It's you will definitely create lots of failures along the way, which I have. I've got I, I wish I still had this photo, but I took a photo once I was cleaning my closet and I had a uh, I was standing up uh, and I had a painting, a pile of paintings the size of me. Oh my god. Uh, and I threw them all out. I, I I'm glad I threw them out because they were garbage. 
but I really wish I had I had my my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, take a photo of that, yeah. and I cannot find that picture. I I really wish I could find that picture. But my point is, you will paint a lot of you will make a lot of mistakes. You'll paint a lot of failures. But um, when you start when it starts clicking, it your work will get a power to it that uh, you know people will be drawn to because they can sense people can sense a, a confident stroke when they see it, um, and that's what I try and go for. And and really that's the secret. It's uh, kind of a glib secret, but it's like, just be confident and move on. Be willing to accept a mistake because in time that mistake might actually be charismatic in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes not. Sometimes the mistake is just a mistake too. Uh, you have to learn, you have to learn the boundaries there. Yeah. And it's part of, you know, experimentation is part of the process. So maybe in other words, when we see that we failed at making a painting, we should take that as a sign that, hey, if we know that we failed, it's because we know what we're going for and we didn't do it. And this is part of getting there. So congratulations, you failed. So you're one step closer to getting yeah. there. So don't see it as a sign to stop. See it as a sign to press on and charge. Hey, absolutely. Yeah, I, you know, it's um, I, I think a lot of people have clued into this now. But I started talking about this to my students a few years ago where like mm -hmm. failure is actually it's not just a good thing it should be the most comfortable thing because you'll probably fail more than you'll succeed, at least at the beginning. Um, even as a professional, you know, you're, you're still going to make failures. And it's like when that happens, yeah, the, you, you don't just throw the whole thing out. Look at it and say, oh, okay, well, where did it fail? I failed in the perspective here or the composition like that should have been over here. But I really like the brush strokes that happened within that failure. So I can yeah. take that and, and next time just fix the mistake and boom, you've benefited from your failure. Like it just, it's a very simple idea, but you, so in time you benefit from failures. Yeah. Like it stings, you know, whenever I paint a painting that doesn't work, which still happens to me, of course it, it, does. it hurts. It's like, mm -hmm. ah, I, I should have got that, but you just do it next time. There's going to be more. It's not like we're, uh, in a sports competition where it's like you lose and you lose the gold medal. It's like, no, sure, you're yeah. just going to do another painting. So yeah. it's not a big deal. And they only get the golden medal because they try and try and try and try over again. And they fail at getting the perfect time until sure. they get it. And then what you see is the final race. It's not all the failures that happen before then. Yeah, exactly. And for us, I guess, uh, going from that analogy, there is no final race for us yeah. as artists. We just keep doing the same thing. You know, we can just keep trying. And, keep and eventually going. you're going to get a few good ones. And, and you're start you're going to start getting consistent good ones, too. Because you understand, and it's like the, that eye-hand coordination that you were talking about the tablet. It's you understand what went wrong, not just at a logical level, but at such a deep connection kind of level that your body kind of reacts to it because you get used yeah. to it more and more. Like I, I used to do like this uh, very loose doodles with watercolors, and that was a time that everything came out so wrong, and I was losing my mind. I can't do this anymore, so I just stopped for a moment and I started doodling people in front of me just for the sake, like just to have fun. Completely mm -hmm. forgot about doing it right and just did for for fun and. By doing that, I learned that, oh, wait, when I'm not worried about where my watercolor goes and I just let it go, I actually end up with some pretty confident. It's better. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, wait, wait a second. So if I care a bit less and if I understand that this might be a good thing, how can I incorporate this into my work? And by doing it over and over and over again, now it's it comes naturally to me because I did it so I did it wrong so many times. Now it actually. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Especially with watercolor. Like it's like w with watercolor. It's like it's it's a dance and you're not leading it <laughs> oh, yeah. so you have to you have to know how to react with watercolor whereas with oil or digital or acrylic you can kind of lead it a little bit more with watercolor like good luck you're just not going to do that <laughs> good luck <laughs> yeah um one more thing just diving a little bit deeper about this whole loose and confidence in your website you have a section for your personal work you have a, sec yeah. a section for your professional work, and then you have a section called Finer Things. Oh, yeah, yeah. What does that mean? Uh, you're the first one to ever ask me that question. <laughs> um, that's a bit of a joke because the section should be called Fine Art. Yeah. But I hate that term oh. because what is so fine about an oil painting over a digital illustration? It's a stupid term, and it should not be called Fine Art. So... <laughs> I, I played on that on my website. I could not figure out what to call it because I wanted to put my oil and like, you know, academic oil studies and, and stuff on that section. Um, and I'm like, I don't want to call it fine art. I don't want to do that. 
So I think my it was my wife I think who who suggested like finer things as a bit of a bit of a tongue in cheek joke, and I'm like, okay, it. let's go with that. I love so, it. So so it's yeah, it's not to be taken seriously. It, 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 in fact, just the opposite. One more rant, and then we're I'm gonna start asking questions from our amazing uh, community. Oh yeah, please. A lot of us artists are forever hung up on having a style. Mm-hmm. Yet, when I look at your work, I recognize it as it being your work miles away, be it traditional, digital, finer, whatever. It's, <laughs> I can see your, your work there. But the style is very different across the board, depending on what your client wants, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what are your thoughts about this one style that artists must and need to make this slim thing like we're pursuing all the time and we need that one style forever, otherwise we're not real artists? Oh, yeah. Um, well to be perfectly honest i used to think that way i really wanted to have a style and usually your style is based on like your favorite artist style mm -hmm. which is what i was you know i wanted to look like this guy or this girl or whoever mm -hmm. that i was really looking up to and that's all natural but I, i think many artists and me included come to a realization that like you are not that person you are you So the way you think and move and react and what you prioritize is, is unique to you. So mm -hmm. that is what determines your style. Not anything you can really practice. Like the, the only thing you can practice is the fundamentals and then maybe a few techniques that artists have shown you. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, sprinkle the water on like this and, mm -hmm. and you know, make a brush stroke like that. Like you can practice little techniques and maybe how to use layers in digital. You can practice that. But in terms of like, The, th the thing that makes a style look like the style is not the technique so much as the prioritizing and decision making along the way. Like, does this line go like this or does it go like that? And why? It's it's not it's the why, because that that will answer all of the questions throughout the illustration. Because just think, like, how many decisions do you have to make in an illustration? Probably thousands the way you prioritize information is how you arrive at your decisions. It's, it has very little to do with the technique, which is why you pointed out that my work looks like my work despite the medium. Mm -hmm. It's because I don't really care what the medium is. It's the decisions are consistent because I'm thinking the way I think. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, to go to part two of that answer, I never thought to myself, Hey, like I have a style. People started telling me that I had a style yeah. and I came to the point, I, I actually remember the first time, I was thinking about this just the other day. It was 2012, uh, because I remember I was doing something that year. <laughs> um, I was hanging out with my cousin, and I had just painted the um, the monster jumping on the bed with the little girl. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I recognize that painting as your style. And I'm like, wow, it, was, it blew my mind. Like, wow, you recognize that as, as me? Like, I never thought that I did that. Um, but... Now, you know, now I've, I hear it all the time now and I take it as a great compliment because it means that I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I guess, truthful to who I am. Consistent. Uh, and that's something that um, I think we're all born with. Like everyone has a personality. It doesn't matter. You can be very, very young. Like I have a 16 month old daughter. She has a personality. I know who she is. Right. That's mm -hmm. the thing that will make your art look like it has a style. Mm -hmm. But the thing that you have to do, and I'll go back to the beginning of my answer now, is you have to practice the fundamentals And, you know, maybe sure, learn a few techniques here and there, but um, the fundamentals will lead you to unlock the decision making in your mind based on who you already are. And mm -hmm. that's your style. That's your style. This is the best answer to style I've ever, ever heard, ever. Oh, thanks. Thank <laughs> I, I put a lot of thought into these things. So Thank you. as a teacher, you have to think about everything. Yeah, because that's the thing. Like, just because you're a good artist does not mean you're a good teacher. And what you just said proves that you're an excellent teacher, not just an artist. Oh, thank you. Okay, so I'm uh, bringing up some questions from our community. We got a bunch, so I cannot ask all of them. Thank you in advance to everyone who uh, brought up the questions. I'll try to fit in as many as possible. So first one from Barim214, and these are all Instagram handles. Uh, they ask, what do you do while your watercolor is drying? Oh, well, uh, that's a good question. Um you you can still work on it uh when it's drying that means it's still wet you have the opportunity the once in a lifetime opportunity to work wet into wet uh so you exploit areas that will benefit from working wet into wet for example 
that's the best time to do color mixtures on the paper because, you know, the, the wet watercolor will mix into the wet watercolor and you get these beautiful transitions. So while watercolor is wet, you can work color mixtures and you can also work edges if you want a very soft edge in your painting, which in painting you generally do want some soft edges. Uh, that's the time to do it when the watercolor is so wet. But sometimes you don't want to do it when it's like perfectly wet, when it's maybe when it's half dry, you get that edge. So that's this ties back to what we were talking about earlier about timing and stuff like that and, and working within those limitations. Mm -hmm. Watercolor will afford you certain opportunities at certain windows of time. So that's what you do when your watercolor is wet. Experiment with those things. Great. And uh, maybe we can dive into more detail on our free live demo. So Barry, if you can yeah. attend, we'll probably, probably there'll, there'll come an opportunity to bring this up. We'll know. For sure. Uh, okay. Polly Appleseed asks, trying to distinguish warm and cool colors is driving me nuts. Blues especially. Any tips? Uh, yeah. Um, let's see. Can I reference a video that I did? Of or... course, you, of course, please, and we will link to it in the the blog post. Okay. Well, there's a few videos that I've talked about this. Um, one is episode five of my Ten Minutes to Better Painting series, which is on my YouTube channel. Uh, episode five is about color harmony. Um, also, there's another YouTuber, very popular YouTuber called Proko, and mm -hmm. I just did a video for Proko's Twelve Days of Christmas in uh, mm -hmm. December last month. And I, in that video, I talk a lot about warm versus cool color temperatures. So those two videos uh, are ones I would, would recommend. Perfect. And then we'll link to that in the blog post associated with this episode, again, at etcherlot.com forward slash Marco, M-A-R-C-O, Marco's name. Okay, next question. This is a very tough question to, to answer. Sid Clicks is asking, why is art so difficult sometimes? Oh man. Okay. So well, many things like you, you can have, there's probably a book to be written with that as the title. <laughs> um, but art is difficult. You know, we've touched on a few topics. so I'll keep it short. Art is difficult because it requires thousands of decisions that have to be consistent. And they have to be tied to your own priorities that you have to work out beforehand. Nothing about it comes easily and it takes a lot of experience to be good at And even when you get good at it, you're always going to be getting better at it so that you never hit a point where you're like, oh, I've got this. Like that mm -hmm. never happens. The only thing that happens is your worst work gets better uh, and you feel a, a little bit more okay with it, but um, a little bit more comfortable in it. And this is uh, the interlude for the book that Marco will write. Uh, thank you, Sue Clicks, for the title, Why is Art Difficult Sometimes? So if we ever get that <laughs> yeah. book done... Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll start with this. Okay, a great question. You kind of started answering this. So, uh, Ito Paul Art asks, who are your biggest influences? Yeah, so again, this there's another book on that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll name a few. Uh, so John Singer Sargent would be maybe my top of the mountain artist that has uh, I've looked up to for the longest and the most. Um, J.C. Leyendecker, uh, just an incredible designer, mm -hmm. but a, a lot of illustrators of that era, uh, Norman Rockwell, these are all names that everyone's heard, um, Mead Schaefer, Dean Cornwell, a lot of the American illustrators I really look up to, um, oh boy, uh, and then more modern people I've really learned from and, and also have looked up to that are still living today, uh, Richard Schmid, Morgan Weisling, Scott Christensen, these are all traditional oil painters. Mm -hmm. uh, I took classes with, um, I took a class from Susan Lyons uh, and her husband, Scott Burdick. Those two helped me with a, a lot of stuff many years ago. Uh, uh, I could go on and on, but then, but then there's a, a, just a whole litany of traditional artists. You know, there's a, there's a guy who really helped me a lot. Um, one of the very first digital artists I ever looked up to, and I just want to quickly give him a shout out. Uh, his name is Mark Beam. His, his last name is spelled B-E-H-M. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I still, I love his work to this day. But when I first started, I, he was like the guy I wanted to imitate. Um, and it, cause just because his work was so, and still is, uh, so wonderfully traditional, but it's done a lot. Well, he paints traditionally too, but it's, it was done digitally at the time. And I'm like, oh, I, like that's what I want to do. And um, he was kind enough to, put a lot of time in answering some of my emails. Oh. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it was his kindness 20 years ago 
that maybe inspired me to to want to help other people too. And I've answered uh, my share of emails today, and I still continue to as I go. And you know, that wow. kind of thing is what helped me become a teacher. I think. Thank you. Yeah, kindness to is contagious. Yeah, kindness is very contagious. People sometimes forget that. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, okay, I will not. I, we don't have time for more questions, but thank you, okay. everyone, for all the questions they sent. I unfortunately cannot make Mark sit here for the whole day to ask all the questions <laughs> that, because we have we have enough questions for a full. Uh, but great questions, uh, everyone. Well, come to the live uh, workshop, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I would be happy to take questions there while I paint. There you go. Exactly. And one last thing before we sign off is, if you'd like to leave any word of advice to our audience, what would it be? Um, okay, well, I think the most helpful thing that I would tell myself many years ago, but and tell you guys now is, uh, don't feel like you have to be sitting at your desk drawing just to practice drawing. Go, go out for a hike. Go, go out with your girlfriend or boyfriend or husband or wife, and and just live your life without a sketchbook in your hand, and you and like internalize those experiences, and that's what feeds your art. So remember, like art is two things. It's it's the skills and techniques required to do it, but it's also like, what are you going to, to then do with it? Like what are your experiences as a human being? You're then going to relay to others in a relatable way. That's all about living your life. So I discovered traveling, you know, uh, uh, several years ago, I discovered a love for traveling that I never mm -hmm. knew uh, I had. And like that traveling alone has fed my art almost as much as like practicing the fundamentals or maybe as much or more. I don't know. as just practicing the fundamentals because those are the things that then come out through your work. So you got to do both. Don't, don't, I, I used to tie myself to my desk and have quotas like four yeah. hours a day or like, t you know, 10 sketchbook pages a day. Like I used to do that, but I would not recommend doing that because it takes away from the whole other side of just living and experiencing yeah. things and then putting it back into your art. I'm not saying don't practice as much. I mean, yes, practice a lot, but don't neglect the other side too. What did you think of the episode? Let us know in the comment section of the post associated with this episode at etcherlab.com forward slash Marco. That's E-T-C-H-R-L-A-B.com forward slash M-A-R-C-O. Or if you're watching this on YouTube, simply let us know in the comment section below. If you're enjoying the podcast, please help us keep the show alive. You can subscribe and give us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts at etcherlab.com forward slash go forward slash Apple. Or if you're more of a YouTube viewer, please make sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our most recent videos. Sharing is caring and every little bit helps. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Until then, let's make more art. Bum 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 ba da dum bum. What a what a color. What a what a color. What a what a what a what a what a color.